Society 13 Podcast Network. Redefining podcasts. Do you like to listen? Hey, spooktacular people. This is Stephen Pappas, and I'm an executive producer of the History Goes Bump podcast. Every episode of History Goes Bump is entirely listener-supported. If you'd like to support the show, check out the Support the Show tab at historygoesbump.com. Boo. History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 203rd episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. We're back. Yes, we are. We're very happy to be home from Road Trip 2017. We hope you guys enjoyed our shout outs. We did three of them this time. That was very cool. Yes, it was a lot of fun. We got to meet three listeners as well. Just had a fabulous time. We're looking forward to planning Road Trip 2018. And our next trip that uh, we're going to be doing a lot of listener meetups with is the Haunted America Conference coming up here at the end of June. Can't wait to do that one. Yes, we have the luncheon on Friday before the conference kicks off. And then several of our listeners are joining us on the Walking History Tour on Saturday night. On this episode, we're going to be talking about the haunted ships of Baltimore. This was suggested to us by, and we got some research help from listener Sarah Gunther. We also have a lot of people to welcome to the Spooktacular crew and a lot of executive producers that we will be welcoming as well at the end of the show. And we just want to say a big thank you to those of you who jumped on board in becoming executive producers. I thought we might get a handful of people who say, okay, I'll, I'll jump in at a dollar. And you guys were incredibly generous. And it just really did our hearts good to have that coming in. So we really want to thank you guys. It was really nice to have those coming in while we were on our trip. Also want to give a shout out to Joe. Thank you so much for sending me some of your book collection. I greatly appreciate that. Yes, she was very excited to get that package in the mail. We want to welcome to the Spooktacular crew, Nettie. Hey, Nettie. Kathy with an IE. Hello, Kathy with an IE. Brindolin. Hey, Brindolin. Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer. Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Emily. Hey, Emily. Bianca. Hey, Bianca. Sandra. Hello, Sandra. Tiff. Hello, Tiff. Neil. Hi, Neil. Jimbo. Hey, Jimbo. Anna. Hi, Anna. Lindsay. Hey, Lindsay. Michelle. Hello, Michelle. Herbie. Hey, Herbie. That was the name of my guinea pig when I was growing up. Adam West. Batman has joined us. Hello, Adam West. Batman. Chris. And this is spelled K-R-I-S-S. Hello, Chris, with a K and a double S. Kadir. Hi, Kadir. Jules. Hello, Jules. And Sophia. Hello, and Sophia. Ray with an E. Hi, Ray with an E. Kaz. Hello, Kaz. Who also joined us on episode 201. Clint. Hey, Clint. Angela. Hey, Angela. Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Chantel. Hello, Chantel. Tavia. Hi, Tavia. I think this is Dana, D-A-N-N-A-H. Hello, Dana, D-A-N-N-A-H. Alex with a Y. Hi, Alex with a Y. Karen. Hey, Karen. Koi. Hi, Koi. And that's Felicia's husband, who also co-hosts the Until Dawn podcast with her. Lowry. Hey, Lowry. Abby with an I. Hi, Abby with an I. Chelsea. Hey, Chelsea. Kim. Hey, Kim. Jalen. Hello, Jalen. Frida. Hi, Frida. And Sharn. Hello, Sharn. Ooh, that's a lot of people in the Spectacular crew. We are almost up to a thousand members. That's pretty amazing. That's very cool. And thank you all for joining up with the crew. I think you'll have a lot of fun. And now, this moment in oddity. Lloyd Cunniff owns bees. He loans his bees out to farmers in order to facilitate pollination. It is really an uneventful process, but this year, 2017, a very strange thing happened. 
In January, as Lloyd's bees were headed to an almond farmer, they disappeared. These weren't a few bees. This was a whole tractor trailer full of beehives, 488 of them. It meant about $400,000 in lost income. Lloyd's bees weren't the only ones to disappear. Other hives across California went missing. Here in the month of May, it was discovered what happened to the bees, and about two-thirds of them were recovered. The culprits were a Ukrainian-Russian mob, and they were re-renting the bees, earning around $100,000. The idea that an organized crime ring kidnapped a bunch of bees to fund their criminal activities certainly is odd. This history podcast is haunted. And now, this month in history. In the month of May, on the 18th in 1927, Andrew Kehoe committed the deadliest school mass murder in American history. Kehoe was 55 and had just lost the election for township clerk in Bath Township, Michigan. He was angered over this loss and about increases to his taxes and financial issues leading to foreclosure on his home. Kehoe started his killing spree by murdering his wife, Nellie. He then detonated several explosives on his homestead shortly before 9 a.m. Almost at the same time, a huge explosion rocked the Bath Consolidated School. Kehoe had spent months planting dynamite in the school and he used a timer to set off the explosion. As emergency crews arrived on the scene, Kehoe drove up in his truck. He pulled out a rifle and shot at explosives in his truck, killing himself, the school superintendent, and several others nearby. The horrible attack injured 58 and killed 6 adults and 38 children. There's a retired fleet of ships now docked at the Baltimore Maritime Museum each with its own history of battle and death, and now with a legacy of hauntings. The USS Torsk is a tent-class submarine emblazoned with a fierce grin of a shark that became the galloping ghost of the Japanese during World War II. The USCGC Tani is a Coast Guard cutter that is the last ship floating that fought at Pearl Harbor, and it participated in the search for Amelia Earhart. The USS Constellation has the distinction of being the first ship built for the United States Navy, and it also has the distinction of being one of the most haunted locations in Maryland. That is probably because it has not only fought in several wars, but it was involved in battling against pirates and the slave trade in Africa. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of these haunted ships of Baltimore. So the first ship that we're going to look at is the USS Horsk. This is one of two Tench-class submarines still located inside the U.S. Submarines used to be named for fish, and that is where the name Torsk originates. I never knew that they named submarines for fish, but it makes sense. It, it makes total sense, but I didn't know that either. The name Torsk is Norwegian, and it refers to the Godoid fish, which is basically a cod-like fish that's found in the North Atlantic. The submarine was known as SS-423 and was built at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard in New Hampshire with the keel laid in June of 1944. That December, it was commissioned and sailed down to Florida, then around to Panama, and then to Pearl Harbor. From there, the tourists moved to patrol the Pacific War Zone. It was during this service in World War II that the Torsk earned the nickname the Galloping Ghost of the Japanese. The Torsk sank one cargo vessel and two coastal defense frigates, with the second one being the last enemy ship sunk by the U.S. Navy in World War II. After the war, the Torsk made her way to Connecticut, where she went into training activities, and she became the divingist. Apparently, that is a word, so it's not just me making it up, people. That really is a word. Submarine in the fleet. In 1951, the submarine underwent a fleet snorkel conversion, which meant that she could stay underwater for longer periods of time because a long tube snorkel extended above the submarine, allowing for fresh air to flow into the diesel engines. This helped charge the batteries and gave her greater speed. This meant that rather than the typical 24 hours underwater, the Torsk could remain submerged for several days. The Torsk was officially decommissioned in 1968 and she underwent modifications at the Boston Navy Yard. 
so that she could be used in training reserves. She was moved to the Washington Navy Yard. In 1972, the submarine was turned over to the state of Maryland to be used as a museum ship in Baltimore's Maritime Museum, and that is where she is today. One tragic event occurred aboard the Torsk, and it seems to have led to a haunting. Joseph Grant Snow was a soldier standing on the deck of the Torsk when it suddenly needed to dive, and he was killed. It seems that his ghost has been trying to get back aboard the ship ever since. So I guess they hear a lot of knocking against it. Of course, a submarine, underwater. Underwater makes a lot of noises, so I don't know that that's necessarily something haunting, but interesting. And bummer for him that he was the only one out there, and they were like, well, we got to dive, so much for you. I know. I mean, I know you sometimes you have to make those decisions in life, but that just seems really cold. <laughs> Next, we're going to discuss the USCGC Tanny. The U.S. Coast Guard cutter Tanny's kill was laid on May 1st in 1935 at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. The Tanny is of the Secretary Treasury class of cutters and measures 327 feet long. She originally was meant for peaceful missions, such as search and rescue and law enforcement, so she only carried two deck guns and two six-pounder saluting guns. The Tanny was commissioned on October 24, in 1936, and was stationed in Honolulu, Hawaii. In 1937, she took an active part in the search for Amelia Earhart and her plane when it disappeared in the Pacific Ocean near Howland Island. World War II broke out and the cutter was upgraded to become a wartime ship with another deck gun and three three 3-inch 50 caliber dual-purpose guns, capable of shooting at both surface and airborne targets. Depth charges and 50 caliber machine guns were added, along with sonar so that submarines could be detected. Her crew remained a Coast Guard one, though. During the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Tanny engaged with Japanese planes flying over Honolulu and started submarine patrols when the attack ended. These patrols continued until the fall of 1943. At this point, the Tanny was transferred to the Atlantic Theater where she served as flagship of Task Force 66, U.S. Atlantic Fleet. She traveled between the U.S. and North Africa and narrowly missed being sunk several times by torpedoes. In 1945, the cutter was reconfigured into an amphibious command ship. She destroyed four kamikaze planes and one Betty bomber during 119 separate engagements back over in the Pacific Theater. And when the war ended, she evacuated Allied prisoners of war from Japan. The Tani would serve again during the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Her non-wartime duties included ocean weather patrol in the Pacific, search and rescues from around the world, and fisheries patrols in the Bering Sea. She came to be known as the Queen of the Pacific. She also was referred to as the last survivor of Pearl Harbor. During the Vietnam War, the Tanny participated in something called Operation Market Time in the South China Sea. While she was working as part of the Coast Guard Squadron 3, she intercepted a lot of illegal arms and supplies all along the coast of South Vietnam and fired over 3,400 rounds of 5-inch 38 caliber ammunition in support of American and South Vietnamese troops. She also provided a lot of medical assistance. In 1972, the Tanny was reassigned from the 12th Coast Guard District in San Francisco to the 5th Coast Guard District in Virginia. And by the late 70s, she was carrying out ocean weather patrols at Weather Station Hotel, which was 200 miles off of New Jersey. And she was doing a lot of hurricane hunting, and she received a special Doppler weather radar installation for that. And then at the end of 1977, she performed the Coast Guard's last ocean weather patrol and closed out Ocean Weather Station Hotel. Then from 1977 until 1986, Tanny carried out search and rescue duties, fishery patrols in the North Atlantic, drug interdiction patrols in the Caribbean, and summer training cruises for the Coast Guard Academy. During this period, she made 11 major seizures of illegal drugs, including a 1985 bust, which netted 160 tons of marijuana, which was the largest in U.S. history. Yeah, it's funny that that was the largest bust with 160 tons of marijuana. Now in a lot of our states, that's just good business. No kidding. (laughs) How things change. On December 7th in 1986, after more than 50 years of continuous service, Tenney was decommissioned at Portsmouth, Virginia, and donated to the city of Baltimore to serve as a memorial and museum. She also serves as home to some spirits. Disembodied footsteps are heard as well as whispered voices. 
One of those voices seems to be speaking Japanese, and it is thought that this spirit belongs to a Japanese pilot taken aboard for medical attention during World War II. The galley had doubled as a medical ward, and that is where the voice is heard. Voices come over the ship's PA system at times, and that system is no longer in operation, so that shouldn't be happening, and it can't be somebody playing a trick. No machines run on the ship anymore either, but that hasn't stopped people from hearing mechanical sounds in the boiler room. There are shadows seen in the birthing area, and lockers open and close on their own. People walking by at night claim to hear the warning bell sound. Near the chief's mess and damage control office is where most of the activity takes place. Sarah Rasher is the Tanny's education coordinator, and she said, I personally have never experienced anything, but we get a lot of reports, and some of the workers swear they've seen something. Overnight workers doing rounds will walk by the chief's mess and see someone inside the room, which isn't possible because all of the rooms on display like this are under lock and key. She also said a parent was sitting in the crew's mess area and saw someone standing in the passageway by the damage control office. The parent got up to check, only to realize no one was actually there. And the reason why she's using the term parent here is because they offer these special little overnights for kids. And then you have parents who are chaperoning them, so that's why you've got that going on. That would have been kind of cool as a kid to have a stay over on a, a cutter like that. That would have been very cool. Ghost Hunters featured the Tanny in Season 8. They cut voices coming over the inoperative PA system. Grant and Jason heard a whistle coming from above them while they were at the captain's quarters. They also heard an obnoxious laugh that did not come from any of their team. A scratching noise was heard in the birthing room, as well as what they surmised as a coin rolling. They felt there was some kind of haunting going on. And then finally we have the USS Constellation. The USS Constellation served for over a century. She was originally constructed in 1854 as a sloop of war and named for an earlier frigate that bore the same name. That frigate had been built in 1797 and served until 1853. She fought in the West Indies against the French and served in the blockade of Tripoli in 1802. She saw service in the War of 1812 and protected the Hawaiian Islands right before sailing to Norfolk, where she was retired and broken up. Much of that wood from this original constellation is part of the construction of the constellation that's now moored at the Baltimore Maritime Museum. And when I would read about this, I would see a lot of people who said that the frigate had just been rebuilt as the sloop. So I'm not exactly sure what all that means. So I'm not sure if we still had the original outer construction and then they rebuilt that or if they just took a lot of the wood and such from the frigate and used that to make the sloop. But whatever the case may be, the original U.S. constellation is not what you see now, but it's pretty darn close. And later on, when they restored the constellation, they wanted to restore it back to what it looked like when it was a frigate. So... Pretty much what you're going to see more there is what it originally had kind of looked like, but it may not be that original ship, if you kind of get my meaning. The second constellation was designed by John Linthal and commissioned July 28, 1855. A unique claim to fame for the constellation is that it was the last sail-only warship designed by the Navy. Her first duty was to sail to Spain to protect American interests during a revolution there. By 1859, the ship was part of the African squadron and stationed off the Congo River. She repeatedly captured ships that were sailing under no flag and without papers. Each of these ships carried hundreds of slaves. The slavers, as these ships were called, would be impounded and sold at auction. Slaves would be freed and taken to Liberia, where the crew would be paid a bounty for each freed slave, which ran about $25. That is around $700 today. So there's a lot of money in them capturing these ships and freeing these slaves and turning them over. Yeah, that, that's really cool because you don't hear about people who are actually being rewarded for helping people become free rather than enslaving. Exactly. The Constellation went on to serve during the American Civil War, and one of her sailors described their work as, quote, trying to capture rebel privateers and cruisers and blockade runners. The process of reasoning seems to be that our ship is supposed to be in European waters and there is no United States warship resembling her cruising about here, and consequently she might approach closely to a rebel vessel or blockade runner without exciting suspicion. 
So basically, they were able to commit sneak attacks. And as you're hearing there, rebel privateers, they were going after pirates. She finished the war as a receiving ship and then worked in training missions. In the late 1800s, the Constellation had several interesting missions. She carried exhibits to France for the Paris Exposition, carried supplies to Gibraltar for the Mediterranean Squadron, and she carried relief supplies to victims of famine in Ireland. The ship carried over 2,500 barrels of potatoes and flour to Ireland. The ship carried works of art for the Columbian Exposition after that and then returned to Norfolk and was placed out of commission. And when it ran all of those relief supplies to the Irish, they had to rebuild the whole bottom of the ship so that they would have these huge containers that they could put all of the food stuffs in. So when they were coming back, they had to take on, I can't remember what they'd said, but they had to take on a lot of other stuff in order to balance out the weight that they were not taking back to America with them. It's amazing how much history just one ship can have, because that's a lot of world history right there. And you think it's been through these wars, and when you're capturing a ship, there's some firing going back and forth, and just keeps right on going. She went back into service again as a training ship, particularly during World War I, until the 1920s when sailing ships were no longer used. She was recommissioned during World War II for use as a relief ship and as a national symbol. She was docked as a permanent exhibit in the Chesapeake Bay in 1955 and placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1966. Today, the Constellation is the last intact naval vessel dating back to the Civil War. She was restored to look like the original frigate Constellation and underwent significant restoration in 1999, after dry rot nearly destroyed her. She is today a museum with some unliving crew members aboard. The Constellation is reputed to be one of the most haunted places in the state of Maryland. There are reports of many spirits lingering on the ship. The ghosts seem to be most active around midnight, and they seem to really like the time period between Christmas and New Year's Day. There is reputedly the scent of gunpowder just before an apparition materializes. Interestingly, many of the ghosts date back to the days of the original constellation and seem to have carried on here even after the rebuild. So the ship was already haunted in its second incarnation. And this kind of is one of those things, Denise, that we discuss when something gets rebuilt over the footprint of something else that was haunted. Do the hauntings continue? So it seems like since they were using a lot of stuff from the original constellation here, that some of the ghosts came over. Because when I was looking at the hauntings, I was like looking at the dates going, well, wait a minute. The constellation didn't go into active service until the 1850s. How can we have ghosts that are dating back before that? So I'm thinking they had to be connected somehow to either the wood that the other ship was built with, or I don't know if they brought some of the other things, furniture, whatever, over from the other ship. But there must have been some kind of attachments here. Maybe even the cannons or something. Something that they were attached to brought them with them. It would be the crew of the Navy submarine Pike that was docked next to the Constellation in the 1950s that would be the first to officially report strange things occurring on the sloop. So there might have been things going on before this, but I don't know that it was something that was readily talked about because maybe this wasn't something that you talked about back then. They claimed to see ghost lights, heard strange noises, and witnessed apparitions. One of the spirits is said to belong to a sailor named Neil Harvey. He left his station during a battle with the French. He was court-martialed in 1799 for cowardice, and the punishment was harsh and deadly. He was tied to the front of a cannon and blown to bits under the order of Captain Thomas Truxton. Man, what a way to go, huh? And apparently this was something that not only America, but also Europe was standard practice for somebody who was court-martialed and sentenced to die. That was what they would do. Tie him to the front of the cannon and fire away. Apparently, it might be quick, but ew. And for him, I don't know how quick because somebody stabbed him before they put him up on that. So I don't know if they wanted him to be in pain before they blew him apart or if the stabbing didn't kill him. So they said, well, let's use the cannon. Not sure, but I can only imagine... It'd be a lot of fun to clean up. Oh. The spirit appears as a shimmering mass and indicates that it wants to be forgiven via EVPs. And some people believe that it appears as a shimmering mass because he was blown to bits. So it's almost like his body can't materialize completely. Okay, my brain was kind of wondering that, and now you confirmed it. Ew. (laughs) 
The next ghost is said to belong to Captain Truxton himself, so we have an interesting interaction here with Ghost. Is he here because he regrets his actions against Neil Harvey? The captain served as an officer during the Revolutionary War and is recognized because of his old Navy uniform. He was photographed by a lieutenant commander on the pike during an appearance and he had a bluish-white radiancy. He appears most often on the forecastle decks. Powder boys would carry gunpowder to the soldiers during battles, and one of them that was killed seems to still be on board as a ghost. Another young spirit belongs to an 11-year-old boy who served as a surgeon's assistant from 1820 to 1822. No one knows why, but he was murdered by two sailors and now seems destined to walk the ship in the afterlife. This spirit was identified by a psychic who had joined Hans Holzer on board for an investigation. So leave it up to your own interpretation. This is coming from a psychic. This next one is as well. A despondent sailor hanged himself aboard the ship and appears as a sad entity floating across the gun and forecastle decks. And finally, there's Carl Hansen, who served as a watchman on the museum ship until 1965. He absolutely loved the ship, and that is why people believe he is still here. He is said to like to play cards and is given the occasional tour to guests who have no idea that Carl is dead. One such person was a priest. A Halloween party hosted on board had him sitting next to a girl and smiling at her. So at least he's a friendly ghost. Yes. Could you imagine, though, getting a picture back and realizing that the guy that you were sitting next to at the party was like not here anymore? Or even worse would be, you know, we always tip our tour guides after we go on a tour. So imagine digging into your pocket and then turning around to give him the tip. And it's like, where did he go? Each of these ships played a key role in America's war history. A lot of death was witnessed by these ships, both on board and out at sea. Have some spirits of those who died on these vessels continued in the afterlife? Are these ships at the Baltimore Maritime Museum haunted? That is for you to decide. Those are some great ships. And Denise, I have a feeling, based on the little hints that you've been giving me, that we will be in Baltimore in 2018. So we'll be able to check those out for ourselves. Yep, that is definitely where I'm leaning very heavily towards for our road trip of 2018 would be Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. On our next episode, Denise, we are going to Memphis, Tennessee. A place that I definitely need to get you to in person someday. And we are going to be checking out Ernestine and Hazel's Juke Joint. That should be fun. It should be a rootin' tootin' good time. This was suggested to us by our listener, Ivy Johnson. We'd love to have you guys check out our website at historygoesbump.com. And Denise, if people want to send us feedback, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And we have a few to share here that we got while we were on vacation. So the first one comes from Margie. And she said, I've been listening to your podcast for about a month or so now. And I love it. Diane and Denise are a great team. Yes, I know you're married. And every episode has been incredibly enjoyable. As a lover of horror movies and spooky TV shows, this podcast is right up my alley. And thanks to listening to Shakespeare and Ghost, I've discovered another podcast right in my own backyard, Twisted Philly. I grew up in Philly and now live in Delaware. Can't wait to give it a listen. Also looking forward to listening to your podcast, Philadelphia City Hall. You take care now. Am I supposed to say bye-bye? (laughs) <laughs> Almost sounds like the end of our show, huh? We got an email from Colleen. Hi, I just started listening to your podcast about a month ago, and I love it. I'm listening to your Appalachian State podcast from May 16th. I was so excited to hear about my alma mater. I lived in East Hall subfloor for my freshman and sophomore year. East Hall is built on a slope, so the subfloor is still above ground. I did hear about the young man committing suicide in the basement during the 1970s. I did not hear about the suicide pact that opens the gates to hell. I really hope that is a rumor. My roommate and I did have some things, quote unquote, happen while we lived in East. I never felt scared or threatened. My roommate and I joked around that he was a friendly ghost. It was just sink running, things moving around and lights flickering. Don't you love it when people have that stuff happen and they say, oh, it was just that. Just that. And the water just turned itself on. No big deal. That stuff could probably all be explained without ghosts. When I tell people that I used to live in East, people familiar with Boone, App State are so eager for me to tell them ghost stories. Thank you for taking the time to focus on Appalachian State. It is a fantastic school and a beautiful location. Keep up the good work. And we also heard from Teresa. She says, good morning, ladies. 
I just wanted to say thank you for your wonderful show. It's refreshing to hear a show that's clean enough for the whole family to hear. You two have an inspirational relationship as well. I always listen to you while I'm out reading meters for a living, and it helps me get through those areas of real poverty with a positive attitude. I just joined as a producer and got to see pictures of you two ladies for the first time. Wow, you are both beautiful. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) I'll take it. Keep up the great work, and I offer my 100-year-old home for your travels anytime. Tiana would love to play in my yard. Blessings and friendship. Kim emailed us. Hello, ladies. I just started bouncing around through your podcast after I heard Diane on the Most Notorious podcast. I'm lucky enough to be able to listen to podcasts at work, and today I listen to your episodes on Deadwood, The Winchester House, and Sleepy Hollow. I used to be the house manager for the Adams House, and I wanted to add a few things if I could. First of all, I laughed when you said that Adams was spelled A-D-A-M-S, not A-D-D-A-M-S, because we had a visitor who was sincerely disappointed to find out that it was not the set for the TV show or the movies. They wanted a refund at first, but we changed their mind once we got through the tour, including a few creepy stories for good measure. You were right that Harris Franklin built the house. About 10 years after the house was built, Franklin's wife, Anna, died. Her wake was held in the house. She is one of the figures most often seen, and I've been on tours with a couple mediums who have felt her presence or seen her at the top of the stairs as you enter the front door of the house. Franklin sold the house to his son Nathan for a dollar. Nathan eventually sold the house to W.E. Adams. During his time there, W.E. lost the rest of his family, including his wife, his last living daughter, and grandchild in a short period of time. His other daughter had died 13 years previously. W.E. was distraught over his loss. That would change when he met Mary Mastrovich on a train ride. The two would be married for just seven years before W.E. had a stroke and died in the house. Mary never felt comfortable in the house. She couldn't stand to live there after W.E. died, so she packed a few bags and moved to California. Everything that was in the house stayed in the house for over 50 years. She did perpetuate the myth that the house was haunted. Remember we said, I wonder if she did that to keep people out? But both because she thought it really was haunted and because it helped to keep the vandals out. However, she didn't leave the house alone for 50 years. Every year, she came back to visit the house, make sure that everything was in order, and to give tours to those who wanted to see the interior. What is truly amazing is that every item in the house is original to the house. That's amazing, for sure. I have lots of ghost stories from the house, like sitting on the front porch and hearing the pocket doors slam in the house with no one inside. I also wanted to add that I've been to the Winchester house and Sleepy Hollow. We visited the house on Friday the 13th for a flashlight tour. They tried to purposely scare you by having people pop out of the different tableau that they had set up throughout the house and people were jumping out of their skin. But it wasn't until we were standing in the seance room that I truly felt frightened. Throughout the house, I'd made sure to be standing in a corner against a wall where I could keep an eye on anyone attempting to scare the crowd. In the seance room, I stood with my back to a corner of the room. No one was on my right and my husband was about a foot away to my left. I had my hair curled that night and I felt someone or something grab one of my curls, pull it down and let go. I think I shot at least a foot forward and looked behind me where I'd been standing, but nothing was there. Ooh. We visited Sleepy Hollow and Salem, Massachusetts for that matter during October. I was in heaven in both locations. One of my favorite things we did was walk through Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. It was drizzling, but it made the ambiance that much better. That evening, we visited the Old North Church for a telling of the legend of Sleepy Hollow. It's done at night, in candlelight, with just a bit of organ music. It was wonderful, and I would highly recommend attending if you make the trip. Oh my God, can you imagine being in the Old North Church and having them tell you the Sleepy Hollow story with organ music? That would be something definitely we should probably add to our bucket list. And then we got an email from Lexi. Hey ladies, just listened to your episode on fairies and thought I would share my experience. Feel free to share this on the podcast if you'd like. Feeling deeply connected to my Irish roots, I have always believed and loved folklore, fairy tales, and magical creatures. Growing up, I was always, well, what an adult would call naive or gullible, I called an imaginative child. I loved watching movies like The Labyrinth, Dark Crystal, and Fairy Tale. I also loved all of Brian Froud's books and illustrations in any book about fairies or magic. One summer, I'm not sure how old I was, maybe 13 or 14, I was sitting on my front steps with my cousin, enjoying the sun when we both saw a very tiny lavender fuzz floating in front of us. Being the curious teens we were, we got up closer to it and tried to make out what it was, all while it was fluttering around. Before flying out of our reach and sight, we both noticed that it seemed to have a head, a body in the shape of a dress, legs, and wings. 
To this day, I still believe we saw a fairy. That's a pretty cool story. That's very cool. We've never had a story like that before. No, thanks for sharing, Lexi. And then, Denise, you have this little passport book that you mention on here every so often that you like to take to lighthouses and get stamps. Yes, so I know that I have several passport books, but this would be, in specific, my lighthouse passport book. Well, apparently, a few of you listeners have decided that you have to have one, too. And I don't know if they ask when you're ordering them where you heard about them, but you guys told the U.S. Lighthouse Society that you heard about those passport books on History Goes Bump, and we received a very nice email from them thanking us for thinking highly enough of their program to mention it to all of you guys and encourage you to do that. And we just wanted to thank you guys for saying that you heard about it here. I'm sure that they were probably wondering like, oh, look, all these people are listening to the same podcast that want lighthouse books. And then they're like, wait, history goes bump. What's the connection? And so Diane just shared with him it was the nerdiness of her (laughs) co-host. We also got quite a few reviews while we were gone. So we're going to spread them out over time to share them with you all. We'll do three of them right now. The first one is from S.J. Begay. Good job, four stars. Informational and interesting. Discusses a popular topic without being too creepy. All around good show. Thank you for that. And Cat Lover 1959 love this podcast, five stars. I'm new to listening to podcasts. I've downloaded quite a few, but by far, History Goes Bump is my absolute favorite. History was always my favorite subject in school, and Diana and Denise always make the stories interesting. I always drop whatever I'm doing when I see there's a new podcast waiting to be listened to. Keep up the great work, ladies. Well, thank you, Cat Lover. And then we got another review from Australia. This is from J.A. Fangirl, who I believe is known as Just a Fangirl, who has her own blog. Entertainment Goes Bump, five stars. The spooky and out of the ordinary have always fascinated me, but I've struggled to find good podcasts that cover this. Then along came HGB. These ladies put in incredible effort when researching their chosen topics and their personalities give a welcoming spin to the great content. So for History with a Twist, give this podcast a listen. Well, thank you so much for that, fangirl. We want to thank you guys for listening to this episode. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. We'd like to thank the following for your one-time donations. Anna Frias, Kathy Franco, Eric Vasquez, Kristen Sandell, and Shannon Esro. We'd like to thank Heather Williams and Rhonda Borgen for increasing your donations. And we'd like to welcome aboard as new executive producers, Bianca Roth, Mackenzie Grundle, Gina Lavoy, Lauren Burke, Jerry Polly of Hillbilly Horror Stories, Kathy Benzunas, Deborah Mobley Burns, Brett Swinson, Pamela Ennis of Pacific Coast Spirit Watch, Lacey Walters, Kristen Swintek, Dana Jones, Dan Garrity, Anne Sophia Olin, Eleonora Conejo, Margaret Widdick, Coy Pittman, Holly Becker, and Joanne Cohen Veda. Thank you to all of you for getting on board. I hope I didn't miss anybody. We greatly appreciate that. Be sociable. Drop the chain rattling, neck biting, and shape shifting, and join us on Facebook and Twitter at History Goes Bump. Like the page and follow us. <laughs>